Welcome to the Musician Technician Entrepreneur Podcast. My name is LB Odom and my co-host is Jeff Jaskowiak. Today we have Digital Audio Recording Arts alum Gabe Jaskowiak. Gabe has climbed the audio engineer ladder, starting at the bottom as an intern and now currently a full-time music engineer at Chicago Recording Company. CRC is the largest recording company in the Midwest, boasting 12 studios and the largest independent studio in the country. Gabe shares crucial, real-life, honest advice on what it takes to succeed as an intern at a competitive recording studio. All right, guys. Yeah, thanks for having me out. Today, like, I'm not really looking to give you, like, a five steps to do this and you will get hired sort of thing. So if any of you guys have questions or just, like, a specific thing you kind of want to hear about, like, feel free to just ask me. I mean, I'm more than happy to kind of take this whichever direction you guys want to go. But yeah, I mean, uh, a little bit of, about CRC and uh, what we do. Um, it's a studio, I mean, it's been around since like 1975 and primarily what we do is uh, music and post. So with music, it's pretty much just, we rent out a room for artists looking to record and provide them with an engineer. We, um, we do not do anything like, record labels type stuff like we don't do promoting or anything like that we're just a recording studio the room to record in and then um with post when i say that it's pretty much just like post production um for like anything either film based or that's needs audio after the fact so typically what we do a lot of is um, vo recordings and final mixes for advertising so like an ad will like a TV ad will be shot and we'll just like record the VO and do the final mix before it broadcasts. Or um, we also do like some like audio books. We produce a lot of radio spots. Um, we do some ADR for, um, for movies like when, and TV shows. Uh, so I mean, that, that's, so I'm probably going to be talking about like the music side and the post side because they're both kind of different, but that's just what, what I mean when um, I talk about those two things. But, um, yeah, the, so I started the internship about, like, I think last May. And it's, uh, we have a, a three-month-long internship that's full-time, 8 to 4, or 11 to 7. There's, like, two blocks. And uh, pretty much that entire company is run by people going through the internship and sticking around. Like, I think there's right now there's one assistant um, who we hired recently because none of the interns really wanted to do post. And then um, I think there's maybe one or two engineers that were hired out. Almost everyone in that company has gone through the internship at some point. So it's definitely, it's one of those things where there is, because, I, and not every studio is like this, but because it's so big, there is definitely like room to come in the internship and actually work your way up through the company. A lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you, it's, it might be more, I mean, it's not going to be specific to like every studio you go to, obviously, but there's definitely a lot I think you could take from it and apply it to any other internships you have at other places, you know, if you're not, if you're not trying to be at CRC. I would say probably one of the biggest mistakes like new interns coming in do is try to almost like talk yourself up too much. You know, I feel like a lot of people always, especially in audio, everyone's always talking up this huge game, trying to prove how much they know to other people and like trying to prove how cool and, you know, badass they are. And I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you, nobody there cares. Even if you have amazing mixes and you can get great songs, nobody cares because that's not what you're there for. Like, they're not, you, if, if you come in and you mix a song and it's great, it's, they're not going to be like, oh, wow, this guy's great. Here, let, let's just start giving you some of our clients, let you engineer it. Like, they're going to be giving those clients to the engineers who have been working there, you know, 20 years. So, really, I, I think any internship you go into, your first thought should be, I, I would say your first instinct should be to listen and to try to feel out the environment of where you're at. Don't just like start trying to sell yourself where you're just trying to talk yourself up to everyone. Kind of like watch, see what's going on. Because 
every place, you know, kind of has its own culture. Even the post and the music sides have their own different cultures at CRC. And just spending some time actually listening, getting the feel for it before you start just, before you, I, I think that that's just a really good way to kind of get a, a feel for it ahead of time. Because the real th truth at, at CRC is the, if you, if you're gonna stick around, it's gonna be because people there like you. So really what you want to focus on is just getting along with everyone there. And it's also about whatever responsibility you're given, doing it really, really well. And so when you come in there, you're gonna be doing coffee. You're gonna be doing coffee runs, you're gonna be doing going and picking up other people's food. You might be cleaning up trash in the alley. We have this little alcove in the back that like homeless people love to congregate there and just fill up with all sorts of horrible things and sometimes interns have to go clean that up and the interns that stay always do it with a smile like it's just um, it's actually not as bad there as it used to be Chris Shepard the original studio manager used to always just mess with interns the first week and make them do the absolute worst thing ever that he or that he could find the first week He's not really there anymore, so it's a little bit, a little bit easier. But I've, I've had to clean, definitely had to clean up human shit there my first uh, while I was interning. So, you know, that that comes with the territory. I think most recording studios they like to mess with people, um, and I think part of that is because there's so much competition there, like mainly because so many people. The thing you always need to remember: so many people can do what you do. So if you know Pro Tools, that's great, but Sometimes, if you know Pro Tools and also how to set up networks or how to um, even, it can even be stuff like, you know how like you're handy, you're good at like carpentry. That actually sometimes can get your foot in the door more than if you're just the Pro Tools guy. Like it's, that's kind of the base thing everyone should know. And a lot of times it's just about being able to find some place where you can bring value. Because CRC is the, it's the largest independent recording studio in the country, and it's the largest er, recording studio in the Midwest. But it still operates like a small business in the sense that there's a, it's not a corporate structure. There's not like one person in charge, and if you do all of this, you will get a job. Or you do all this, this is the protocol. It's kind of like a lot of people winging it. <laughs> you know what I mean? So if you can... No one's really going to like give you a job. So for instance, if you're great at tech and IT stuff and you just start coming up to people and they're like, hey, I can do this, like you might actually start, uh, you know, start just getting job or jobs that way. So I was actually just interviewing intern applications uh, like yesterday. I was, I was talking to some of the new people. And I think one of the other most important things to do just as an intern and one of the things that surprisingly a lot of people just do not get is just etiquette of what to do when you're in a session. So one of the first questions like we always ask is like, all right, so you're in, you're in the session with an artist and the artist turns to you and is, asks you your opinion and is like, hey, what do you think of the song? Do you think it's cool? Like, what would your response be? Like, what would, what would, one, what would some of your initial responses be if that happened to you? Tell the truth. Yeah. Tell the truth? That's, that's, a lot of, that's a lot of people's thing. That's the worst thing you could do. Do not do that ever. Let me tell you this. As an intern, nobody wants your opinion. It's just the truth. Especially, I mean, even if the artist does, I guarantee you the engineer does not. If, if the artist asks you that question, you just either agree with whatever the engineer just said last. Or you just say, oh man, yeah, it sounds good. Like, part of, I think what some people don't get is when you're interning in a session, you are literally there to be a fly on the wall. And I think a lot of people hear that and they're like, yeah, yeah, cool, so we're just going to sit in, but then they don't actually act that way. Like, you should not be noticeable because that's um, what's most important in any session is the engineer and the client's relationship with each other and keeping that workflow going. And like, we just can't have interns going in and derailing sessions. Like, because what happens if then an intern says like, "Oh, I don't like that," and then the artist is like, "Yeah, you're right. That's not good. Like, we gotta, 
we got to change this. Like, that's a really easy way to get fired there. So it's, there's definitely, you have to kind of know your place as you start out. Because even as like an assistant now, when I'm assisting sessions, I honestly, my, my, most of my like day-to-day -day workflow, especially if I'm in a session that's um, like a, a client like Chance or Jeremiah or someone like that, it's, I'm usually sitting in the corner just watching and waiting for something that I need to do. And then I'll jump up and do it if I see it or if they ask me. I'm not, I don't go, I'm not like trying to kick it with the clients. You know what I mean? It's, it's in the end, you're there to just make the session run as fast as you can or as well as you can. And uh, that's another thing I think as an intern if you, it also, I guess it depends on what your end goal is. Because if you really want to work in a studio, who you should be paying attention to is not even necessarily the engineers, it's the assistants. Because that is what you might realistically do. I mean, that might be what you could be doing. Like, as an engineer, you are never, you probably have to work at a place like 10 years before, like, someone calls and the, the studio manager, Sarah's like, calls you up to engineer the session. Like she's gonna call the people she trusts first. So if you're going, if you wanna go out and get your own clients and bring them into studios, oh my glasses are just destroyed. That is, that's an, another way to do it. But that's not, I mean, but if you're actually trying to work there, like just pay attention to what the assistants are doing. Cause, um, do you guys have any any questions about what I'm saying? Are you kind of following it? I have a question. Yeah, what's that? Um, so you say, like, it's best to be, like, a fly on the wall as, like, the intern, which makes sense. But, like, I guess, like, if there's, like, a lot of interns, like, is there a need to kind of separate yourself, or do you kind of just follow directions? It's about who you separate yourself to. You know, the best way to separate yourself as an intern is to get in tight with the assistants there. Because that's one of the other things about CRC is it's kind of like... It almost is like a self-sorting organism, kind of, if that makes any sense. Where it's not like there's some person at the top and you just like need to impress them and they'll be like, you, you're cool. Like, if you are good, I mean, honestly, the people who are going to train you is going to be people like me, the assistants, like the people who train me even. I, I um, made friends with some of the assistants and they basically showed me how to do the job. And like, those are the people you need to talk to because you need to basically know how to do the job so then when a session comes up and Sarah, our studio manager, is looking for someone to fill the session, she knows, oh, I can call this guy because it won't crash and burn if he does it. Like, no one's going to train you if they don't like you. So if, so if that makes sense. So you're not trying to set, you're definitely not trying to set yourself apart for the client, anybody coming in, like, and not even necessarily the engineers. I definitely try to make friends with the people not quite at that level first. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Like the people who are training you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, I remember you saying, like, you know, talking, at, well, giving suggestions or whatever, like, during the session as an intern is bad. But what if your suggestion ends up working? Are you still probably going to get fired? Just don't do it, man. <laughs> that, I mean, that's as honest. If I would, it doesn't matter. I would be complaining about an intern who was talking in my session like that. Does worrying about your job security make your work any, like, does it make you hate what you do? <laughs> no, but it makes it stressful sometimes, I'm not going to lie. I mean, it's a part of the thing is, like, job security, it's kind of a weird, it's, the entire music department at CRC runs on freelance. Um, so all the engineers there, even, like, all the assistants there, I'm freelance there. So I'm, I mean, I'm there all the time, but basically how it works is it's like a buy session, like it, I'll get booked for a session, I'll work that session and get paid for it. So just the freelance life, there's always that like job security stress that's going on, you know, so there's definitely, you got to just be prepared for that. But I mean, like, is it one of those things where like project by project, you're just kind of always worrying like the worst could happen? No, nah, man, I love what I do. I don't hate what I do. Well, yeah. I will I mean, say. Because like obviously mixing for like, bands on like a low-key basis is only one thing you know you can't fire yourself 
But yeah. I mean, like, you have to worry about all these other factors that can go into it. So I feel like it would just make it really stressful. It is, and it definitely is stressful, especially in the beginning. Once you kind of get past that, and I mean, I'll talk a little more about like how sessions actually work and what I do. I mean, it's definitely, it is stressful, and I think if you can't handle stress well, you're going to have a hard time, um, especially because a lot of times you're working for engineers who might not be the best people or the most understanding people. So like sometimes, so then, and then they get stressed out. And then I guess you, you definitely, you have to get good at just, you know, taking everyone else's like shit basically. Like that's all I really can say is like, as an intern, you'll probably get the most of it. Like, cause everyone will blame you for stuff. Even if it's not your fault, you just gotta be like, whatever. And then as the assistant, like, I'll have engineers blame me for something that was totally their fault in front of clients before just to save face. Like that happens. It's, it's, it's a definitely a business that's a totem pole and the farther down you are on it, the more you'll have to deal with. So, I mean, you kind of, you have to be sure to just let stuff wash off you. You can't, if you take stuff really personally, you're going to have a hard time as well. Okay. Yeah. Um, since like when you become an intern, probably, like most of what you're doing is like coffee runs and food runs. Like. Yeah, I'll um, as an intern, like you clean up the studios, um, you or you just keep the studio clean. You make do coffee, you do food runs for clients, do trash dishes, that kind of thing. Like that's like your base duties, and then on top of that, you can sit in on sessions. You can request sit in on sessions. And you can also request bumpables where if you get either an assistant or a crew member or someone there to come into a studio with you, you can mess around with the studio. You just you can't be in there by yourself as an intern. But if you uh, if you're really serious, I mean honestly, it's crazy to me how many people come through and intern there and spend their whole time sitting in the basement just like hanging out when they're not doing the regular intern stuff. Like if you really want to do well there, I would be trying to assist in, or trying to sit in on every single session you can. Um, not expect, because a lot of people I feel like will just try to get like the good sessions or just the music sessions. Like, but if you really want to work there, you should be trying to see what the day to day work is like. You know what I mean? You're not, not just the cool sessions. You should just be trying to sit in on it. And honestly, it's, even if you're in some like boring Ace Hardware ad record, it's probably still better than sitting around in the basement like or you know doing dishes all day yeah i was, I was just gonna ask like what would be some good background knowledge since but since you go in like as an intern just doing food runs and stuff like what should you know yeah um well like i'll for instance i'll just kind of tell you like what we look for in um with like the tech portion of our internship application like honestly what they'll do is they'll give you the first thing we do is like give you this gear list and like ask you to identify all this gear. And then after that, I mean, there's just kind of a personality exam. And then, but then our tech exam, it's, it's pretty basic. It's like um, pretty much we find like a, the mass or the monitoring section or the master section on the console and it's being able to like mute it and dim it and switch between speakers. Then we have like a Pro Tools uh, session where you like make a reverb bus. And um, the most important thing I would say then is signal flow is really, that's what's going, I mean, that's if you can understand how something gets from like point A to point B, like that's really the most important thing because every single studio is different. So if you like just learn how to run this studio and don't actually know how the signal is getting to where it's supposed to be going, when you go into a place like CRC, it's just going to be, completely different. And honestly, like each of our studios is different. Like we have we have like 12 studios and a bunch of them are different. They're not all like carbon copies of each other. So just being able to track down what goes to what like this output of this goes to the input of this and the output of that goes to the input of this. Like that's if you can kind of wrap your head around that kind of stuff, it'll definitely put you in um put you in a good place. Pro Tools is definitely important. Every, almost everything we do is Pro Tools. Actually, everything we do is Pro Tools. Um, but yeah, it's, I mean, there's people have definitely gotten, I've, interns have gotten fired. Most, in, it's, it's really surprising to me how bad of interns will make it all the way through till the end. Um, 
I think the interns that I can remember getting fired, one of them uh, fell asleep in a session, a post session, is like snoring. Um, another one was Snapchatting a chant session, so then like when all the volume went down, you like heard it being played back on his phone. So yeah, oh, yeah, put Snapchat away in sessions. That's another thing I forgot. Do not Snapchat anything. Um, don't be taking pictures, especially not as an intern. Just have your phones. Yeah, I mean, you can sometimes, I mean, I, I use my phone for work. Like, I take my notes on my phone. It's not like the worst thing if you have your phone. Just don't be taking Snapchats. Don't be buried in it. So now that you work full time, like, what is your schedule like? And you well, mentioned that you're like, you go session by session. So when you're not doing sessions, yeah. what Yeah. Well, I'll explain. I don't know. <laughs> F- um, because I'm freelance, I don't even know if necessarily full time is like at CRC is the right way to put it. I'm um, my schedule is kind of crazy. <laughs> it's just like depends. It's it's really kind of week by week sometimes. I mean, I'm a freelancer, so I have some personal clients that I I'm not at CRC necessarily five days a week. I'm there if I don't have anything, and I do work there most. I mean, I work there pretty much full time hours, especially when it's busy. My schedule is really messed up because I do music and post which most people don't. Most people pick one or the other. I just kind of like was stubborn enough that I started doing both. And uh, so sometimes it's like, sometimes I work, you know, 8 a.m. till 9 a.m. Or, or like 8 p.m. till like 9 a.m. Like Jeremiah loves working all night and I'm all night. But then like a post session will come in that's like advertising. It's more corporate. It'll be nine to five. And obviously I don't like come off of a music session into a post session most of the time. But, um, but my schedule is really, it depends on when people want to book. It's, it's a little crazy. I definitely, if you're, especially if you're trying to do music, if you need, if you're one of those guys, like a good way to start practicing is just to stop sleeping. I'm going to be real with you, seeing how long. Uh, I was working G Herbo a while ago, and I think I built 26 consecutive hours, slept for seven hours, and then built 16 more. But yeah. Like, do you ever get like fatigued or anything? Like, yes. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And that's when you either, I mean, honestly, if, if it, earplugs will be good for that sometimes, or even just headphones, putting them over and not plugging them in. And sometimes I just have to get a step out of the room and just take a break. So have you ever had any instances where during a session, like you've, you've screwed up on something and you felt like you were going to lose your job? Yes. Yes, definitely. I would say that there's moments. So as an assistant engineer, basically what we have, like this workflow down at CRC where you have your senior engineer who's the one who pretty much like, you know, is recording everything, running Pro Tools. He's the one really in charge of the session. As an assistant engineer, I'm there setting up all the gear. Um, make, you know, making sure everything works, like testing everything. And then, for instance, like any, any time it's like we need to set up something really quick or we need to adjust something, I have to run in. And then I also have to, um, especially if there's no intern in my session, like I might also have to go do like food runs for these people. Like back to G Herbo, just because of some of the weirdest stuff I had to do during a session. Like at one point, it put me in an Uber to go like drive down to a Target and pick up some Nerf guns for them. Like, if they do that, I, any, any, yeah, yeah, they, they, yeah. Anytime they want something, the, basically the goal, our goal as a studio, just as an experience in general, is people say they want something and we just say, okay, let's do it. How do, how do we get this for you? So sometimes that comes down on me as the assistant to try to figure out how I'm going to get something for these clients. Like, running a session with a client is very different than running a session with your friends or doing a session for school. Like, it's definitely, it's high pressure. The, our goal is always to have the artist be able to express their creativity, like, have it flow flawlessly. Like, how many times you guys had sessions where you come in, you're all expire, inspired, you want to go put an idea down, and then something's broken, and you get end up with a 40-minute, like, block that you have to try to fix this problem and it just completely kills the creative drive. Like that's what we're trying to avoid at all times. So, because of that, um, it's, a lot of it is about being prepared. But it's it's you have to start seeing ahead. You have to start seeing ahead of like what 
could they be asking for? Like, what could be coming next? Like, that, that's definitely good as an intern to kind of start getting a feel for that. But as an assistant, it's definitely your responsibility, too. Like, I think there was, there was one chance session I was running where I was coming in on someone else's uh, setup. So the other assistant had set up. And we had a big, we had, like, a B3, Rhodes, Keys, um, vocal mic, like a production booth. We had all this stuff set up. And, uh, and I was trying to figure it out. And, like, all of a sudden, and so he wanted, like, stuff right now. And all of a sudden, he's, like, coming up behind my back, like, come on, man, we need this. What's going on? We need it right now. And I'm just, like... And I just had to, like, take a minute and, um, I mean, and I, I got it going, but, like, there's definitely moments like that where you're just, like, oh, my God, I'm terrible at this. Like, I need to figure it out. And, and like, after that, it's always about seeing one step ahead. Like, you see, like, I'll be, I'll be in the, you know, in the room. All of a sudden, I see Chance kind of, like, pulling out his laptop over on the, like, side credenza. If I see that, I'm going to, like, go and get an eighth-inch to XLR adapter and kind of just go put it over there. So that way, when he's ready to, if he wants to, it's, he, it's all ready to go so he can play from his computer into the speakers. It's that kind of thing where, like, I'm not waiting. Because if you're always waiting for people to ask you for stuff, you're just going to start getting behind, and then you're just going to be running around like crazy trying to get all the stuff for all these different people. You always want to try to be thinking what this person may need and going for that. Like, another good example is, um, like, people bring a dog, like, old dog in the session. I just look at that dog, and I'm like, that's going to piss. So I go and find, like, rags to keep off to the side. And then as soon as it happens, I'm like, I'm there. I clean it up, and I'm gone. Like, instead of, like, oh, the dog just peed all over the floor. Now I got to go run around the studio to try to find paper towels. Like, even just simple stuff like that. Um, you always, you're always trying to be kind of ahead of the flow. Because when you do, when you are on top of everything and there aren't, um, like, uh, I don't know, did you guys see um, Chance did, like, did that new song on Stephen Colbert a while ago with uh, Caesar? Yeah, like that session, like they made, they wrote that song. Um, we basically, we had, um, like Daniel Caesar was in, so we had like his guitar set up, Rhodes, piano. Um, you know, Chance had his, had his mic. And we basically just had it all set up so people could just go and play. What, there was a bunch of musicians in the studio. They all could just play whatever instruments they wanted, and they were just doing a live jam. And that's how the song basically came about. So when you are on top of it and you, and you make it so the artists are free to be creative, like you can get some really cool moments and some really, really good music. But you have to... Um, it's, it's always just trying to stay ahead of everything. It's like a wave. You're trying to like surf on top of it. If you're underneath it, trying to like gasp for air every time, you're just going to have a terrible 10 hours while you're assisting. Uh, well, kind of like how much would you say it's about what you know versus who you know? Because it sounds like kind of like to get like better, it's what they got to have to kind of know like people that have these situations so you can know what to prepare for later on in these situations as well. So like how much is it like having background knowledge versus knowing people that can help you to kind of... Well, I will definitely say the business is very much who you know. If you know people, it's going to be easier for you. But for instance, I didn't know anyone at CRC when I started. Um, so I'd say it's not even necessarily only about who you know, but it's definitely about who you get along with. Because if you know, if you get, get along with the people at the studio and they like you, they'll show you the ropes. Because that's one of the hardest things is, I mean, even just with like learning the building, like there's all these studios, because we have all these freelance music engineers and freelance assistants moving around between all these music studios, stuff gets moved around. Stuff isn't always like where it's supposed to be. So sometimes just knowing like, all right, I got to find the, like, one of the biggest things is just XLR to um, eighth inch cables. Because so many, like, hip hop sessions, they end up because they want to go out of their laptop into Pro Tools or just play something off their phone. Like, just knowing where that stuff is, some of it's just time and experience and, like, actually spending time. Like, me doing a session now is so much less stressful than when I first started. Because when I first started and they were like, hey, get me this, I was like, okay, where is that? And, um, so, I mean, I'd say it's, it's definitely what you know is, I mean, it's definitely good to know stuff, but if, if you get along with people and you, you can learn, I mean, that's another way, another way to do it. Um, 
but I will say definitely once you get in, like, it's definitely who you know. Like, as far as once you, like, if you get work at CRC, it's because the studio manager for music or the uh, executive producer for Post, Rose, so it's like Sarah and Rose, they're the ones who book you. So if they're comfortable with you, you start getting booked. Like, that's really, is, at the simplest level, that's what happens. If, if these two people are comfortable with you, you get work. It's not like you follow these steps and then you get work. It's just, it's not. So, um, so it's, it's, it's definitely a people business. I'd, I'd spend more of your energy trying to fit in with the people or even just learning from the people than I would like trying to show how much you know. How fast do they expect you to set up a session? <laughs> that, I mean, that depends. Um, quickly, as fast as possible. You, sh you need, it's not, you cannot, um, it just, it depends. Because, like, sometimes, yeah, you know, we'll know chances coming in the next day, and you have to, you have the whole night before to, like, set up, and you can be as slow as you want. But then other times it's like, hey, this person's coming in in an hour and it's just all hands on deck. You definitely need to be able to set stuff up well under pressure and have it work. Like, so th I would say like, that's definitely one of the big things. If you do want to practice anything, it's being able to set up and tear down quickly. Um, that's, that's one of the appeals for places like CRC that we are able to just Oh, you want that set up? Like, especially during a session, man, like, I've had to, like, nail, I'd have to, like, go and, like, nail uh, blankets to the wall, like, in between takes. Like, sometimes it's really stressful and crazy what you have to do, but quickly, but, um, so, yeah, speed is good, but don't break anything. Uh, I was just going to say, so they expect you to set up, like, like, the Pro Tools session, too, or does the senior engine? Uh, it depends. Post, uh, we set up a lot of the Pro Tool sessions for the engineers. That's another thing. If you guys have any questions about like the difference between music and post, I'd be uh, more than happy to go into that because they really are very different things. But um, how many people? It's like a big crew. One, two, three. Set, set, set studio. Um, there is a. Yeah, the, actually, one of the other ways to help set up the studio fast quickly is to get interns to help you. Like, really, what it is is when you're the assistant on the session, you're the one who is ultimately responsible for setting up the room. But, like, you can get interns to help you, or uh, we just kind of have a, all the assistants right now, we just kind of, I mean, we all hang out all the time, and, like, anytime someone has a session and I'm there, like, I help them set up or help them tear down, and they help me set up and they help me tear down. So it's not always just you by yourself. But it's you by yourself if no one likes you. You know, you know, it's just, <laughs> yeah. My question is kind of like in the beginning, getting the internship, because, you know, there's a lot of applicants. So, like, to make your, like, self stand out in, when it's, like, that stage of the internship, what, what would you say is, like, a good way to make yourself stand out, kind of like besides a killer resume kind of thing? Um, I'd say resume is someone important, I would take any, if you're not completely confident in your English abilities, take it to the writing center or something, because I know Sarah, just when she's weeding through it, sees a run on sentence, and she's just like, nope, next one. Just because it's just how, I mean, how it helped weed it out. Um, I would also say just, um, I'd be, I'd call, I'd be persistent, I'd show that you're, you're um, interested. I mean, it's, some of the time I'm like, I hear that there's 800 applicants and like I see some of the interns we have and I'm like, really? Like, we really had 800 applicants for this and this is who we got? So like, I think that if you have um, a pretty solid, like, I mean, you don't need to have like a killer resume. No one there thinks you're making like gold records already. You know what I mean? Just, yeah. um, and I'd say just make sure that you let it known that you're there to learn and that you don't have an ego. So does CRC use um, like a lot of like preamp racks and stuff like that, or is it more kind of like what we do, where we just kind of snake it right? To the yeah. Well, we have um, we have uh, one Studio Five has an SSL console. It's an old school um, analog console that's kind of like this. It's not quite set up the same as this because uh, we have it set up so you could also run it completely through the board if you wanted to. Whereas this is kind of set up specifically, but. 
Um, almost every other student or studio, it's preamp racks. And we have a lot of like DigiDesign D commands or pro controls, which are basically just like consoles, but they're really just like glorified mice. They just control Pro Tools. So um, yeah, so we do a lot of preamp racks. There's some that sit in the individual studios, and then we have a lot of floating. So you just have to patch that stuff in. Patch bays. If you guys don't know patch bays, I try to do whatever you can to get comfortable because we use patch bays like all the time for everything. Do they mostly have like them configured per room, so each each rack is mostly this most of the time? Um, we have, for instance, Studio Four, um, which is the biggest room we have right now, which is like the main one that most people uh, like. I mean, that's like you know Chance, Jeremiah, Vic Mensa. Those guys use those rooms a lot. They uh, that one has like it's just kind of like a set rack that all the inputs are even normal to that. So you like plug into mic line one, it goes to this this pre. Um, most of the other studios, we just have cables. So like you have a either a panel for like a mic um, like mic pre XLR inputs and outputs are what they're called, and so you just basically take whatever you want, plug it into the back with XLRs, and then move it with the patch bay wherever you want it. Yeah. Are there, are the, in the rooms too, the Pro Tools templates to those racks, or do they have to always generate? Well, no, they're, um, I mean, like, the, there's no real template for the Studio 4 or the music rack, because it's just basically, like, each input is its own pre. Um, so you just, like, you want to use the 1073, you put it through the input 13. Um, or mic line 13, and then, uh, but like the post rooms are different. The post rooms are all set up for like a template's already set up for the room. Because music sessions, you know, you just kind of like make a Pro Tools session. Like if you're, if you're looking to do post audio, like anything for basically any audio with anything like audiobooks, TV, radio, movies, anything like that, you have to get very good at Pro Tools routing internally within Pro Tools. Because, for instance, like one of those sessions will come up. We might have one talent in LA, and then we might have you know, another talent in South Carolina. And then the clients are in the room with us, and we're directing everything. And so we need to be able to send everything that, like we need to be able to send only what we need to to each of the, cli each of the talents. And then also, basically, control, make sure that nothing's like feeding back. So there's a lot of kind of complicated routing. And that's where post, I mean, honestly, post, it's like, it's always like two mics. We have a Sennheiser 416s and U87s. And then we almost always just go through Hardy M1 racks for the pre's. So it's like really kind of simple setups, analog wise, but then the routing can be a little more complicated. So um, be good about busing and understanding matrixes or matrices if you are trying to do post. What's that? When you say working with the talent, do you, are you working with them in real time? Yeah, time? we use, uh, we have several ways. We do it ISDN boxes, which are kind of like the old school way to do it, which is like a special phone line that costs like 30 cent or 50 cents a minute or something to use. <laughs> um, and so we'll just dial that box and it's, it's routed to like an out in Pro Tools. So like usually with CRCs, for instance, like output five, um, actually no, it'll be like output 13 goes to that box and then the input of the box is like input five. So that way we're sending signal to them and then um, getting signal back real time. And uh, you know, sometimes we're connected to two or three of those boxes. We also we use Source Connect sometimes, even Skype sometimes. Um, but yeah, the point of those is it's it's a phone line basically that can do high quality audio real time. So we're not even just like synced up; like we're actually using the audio that we get through the phone line. That's amazing. Yeah. So you could be doing a voiceover with somebody in California. Oh, there. many, many, many times we do that. That's like a very common thing. A lot of times too, we'll um, like some of the sessions I work where I actually end up engineering. It'll be stuff like T Mobile, like I did spot for T Mobile where. They're out um, in LA somewhere, and I'm just sitting in there with the talent in the booth, just like making sure the levels are good and making sure the signal goes to them. And they're running the session from a completely different studio somewhere else. And you only do that for like posts? You don't really do that for music? No, posts? that doesn't really happen with music. Hmm. Is there like a certain reason why? Because I feel like that could be like useful kind of. 
I mean, if you really wanted to, I guess you could. It's just most people, it's not really a precedent people have set. Did you have a pretty good grasp on like uh, routing and signal path with Pro Tools before you went to CRC? I definitely got better when I was there. And I will definitely, I w if, you don't, if you think that you'd come in and you wouldn't understand everything right away, I wouldn't feel bad about that because you definitely will learn. But um, I guess it's more just about being able to, it's, it's, it's once again signal flow. It's really, really important to know where signal is coming from and where it's going. Just with every aspect of audio, it's like the most important thing. Because it's basically the same thing. It's like, like doing it in Pro Tools or doing it on some analog system. It's the same thing in concept. It's just how you're sending the signal. What's up? So uh, being a graduate from here, what did you find most valuable? The thing that I've coming from here that I felt like helped me the most coming from here was the fact that I had a ton of hands-on experience that I feel like a lot of people that I know who went with Columbia and or... Flashpoint just didn't have because they just like I mean Flashpoint comes in and teaches classes at our school and you always have all these like 15 people crowded around a board and watching someone do it and like that's their class time you know it's way more important to actually do it yourself there's stages I feel like doing something with someone else showing you how to do it and with someone else there it's like that's one thing being able to do it by yourself is something a little bit harder to do it's like the next level and then being able to do it with some like six foot tall engineer down your back yelling at you to get it done faster, like that's when <laughs> that's when you know you're comfortable with it. We talked a lot about post. What uh, what's like the music side like? I mean, what are um, what does that entail? Music is much more. It's much bigger setups. Like for instance, I mean, because like I was saying, like post is routing. Music, it's about like big setups. For instance, like okay, when Chance comes in. It's probably like at least a two or three hour setup before because we set up like colored lights everywhere and kind of have to get the room all vibey. And then, and then I have to set up and mic piano, roads, keys. I have to set up a production booth for him and route a mouse and keyboard over so he can actually like control. Because you get an extender, so basically he can actually like control the session and like see, like, like if he's like wants to edit it himself, he can get like a TV set up so he can see that. A lot of times Chance will come in with like five, ten people. And so we'll also have like production booth set up where I take a, I have like a table set up with like some speakers and just a Mackie mixer and a little Scarlett USB interface so someone else can be working in there. Have to get like the, you know, the vocal mic set up. Sometimes guitar and drums. I usually don't set up guitar and drums unless they want it though because that's just a little much. But yeah, it's a... There's a lot, a lot more, like setups with music sessions. Definitely, you don't, you never have to like make the Pro Tools session or prep the session. Like post, you have to prep the sessions. Like a bunch of people send you videos and stuff, you have to like download them and put them in the session. Music guys, the engineer is usually in control of the whole Pro Tools session, so you don't have to like set that up for them. It's more just about getting all the gear set up, and then um, you have to do a lot more runs as a music engineer or music assistant. Because if you're there in the middle of the night and someone wants Taco Bell, like, you're the one who has to go get it. Like, during the day a lot, you can go send interns. Can you just talk through, a, you know, maybe the approach that you've, you've seen Chance take? I mean, does someone have the drums, someone have the guitar, or someone have the Yeah, like, well, jam or you know, what? one of the things that was probably craziest for me is because um, Coloring Book kind of came about, there's Donnie Trumpet and the Social Experiment. Um, you know, they had a record a while ago, but the social experiment is basically just this like Chicago group of all these guys who just um, started making music together and they weren't like super worried about red tape, like they were just trying to make cool stuff. And Chance kind of like brought them in with Coloring Book. And so what it really turns into is this co like really collaborative experience. And honestly, the one thing that was kind of crazy to me is so much music, it's made, um, even like J. Cole a while ago came through and was doing the same thing. Like, I think it's kind of like a standard, a lot of these big guys, where they will come in and either go out of an interface or sometimes just out of an eighth inch to XLR, and they'll be working off of their laptops and just recording into Pro Tools like a tape machine. 
So the engineer is pretty much just like in Pro Tools, recording everything and like moving everything around, and everyone else is producing content on their own laptops going into Pro Tools. A lot of guys use Ableton, but I mean, there's also Fruity Loops. I have FL Studio still big, like uh, 808 Mafia came in right now in the south side. That guy can crank out a beat so fast, like it's nothing, and he's, he's all in FL Studio. Uh, and uh, he's actually the one who bought the Nerf guns. <laughs> <laughs> So they're all working simultaneously? A lot of times they will, yeah. And a lot of times they're multiple people doing multiple things. Like maybe some guy's working on a beat over in a corner and then they're working on something else and then he'll come in and bring the beat and they'll start vibing with it. It's all about like really catching a vibe like with those guys. It's about keeping it open so they can do whatever they want when like inspiration comes, kind of. Definitely a lot of, uh, a lot of using Pro Tools as a tape machine. So what do you say, like having a background in a lot of different DAWs would obviously be super like, beneficial. Yeah, I think it's good. I mean, I think Ableton, you should know Ableton. If you try, especially if you're trying to produce at all and you're trying to like make music and you actually want to break into that side where you're not just engineering, like Ableton is a must know for sure. I mean, Logic too, though. Logic, Ableton, FL Studio are pretty much the, the three that get used. And then Pro Tools just for the actual like recording. And if you're doing any vocal editing or vocal production, that's all Pro Tools. No one records vocals in other programs. Uh, how often do artists come in and ask for like, uh, like an instrumental or production side? Not with us. Not hardly ever. Like that's not really what we do. They usually have their own people. Like or that, for instance, like chances, guys, half the people he's bringing in, like Peter Cottontail, um, you know, Donnie Trumpet, um, another guy, Smoko. Or Tokyo even sometimes like a lot of these guys they're the ones kind of providing the beats and like bringing the beats so it's very rare that so, um, <clears throat> starting out as an intern and like sitting in on sessions and doing stuff like that like did you have to like kind of like get over the hump of being like intimidated by like all these like other people who kind of like were really yeah if you're also that's another thing you cannot be starstruck when you're working there if you're going around trying to ask people for like autographs anything like that you're gonna be fired so quickly. You have to, you know, it'll just be, I mean, honestly, you kind of just get used to it. It's kind of, it's like random stuff happens. Like, um, like yesterday I was there and like Jimmy John, like the guy from Jimmy John's just like walked past and like, I really just wanted to ask him about posing naked with a shark, but like I didn't, you know, <laughs> just like, oh, so you like killing rhinos. But like, you just kind of gotta, <laughs> you just, you just gotta like not, I mean, you can't let it phase you. And definitely you cannot fanboy out. Like that's cause think about, it, we're trying to create a good experience for the client and they don't want to be coming to a place where you have some intern asking them for autographs or some of the other stuff that they have to deal with on the street. It's just not what we do. So for those times when you're, you know, working hours on end or else you have engineers kind of getting too stressed out, but you know you can't like stop and do whatever, like how do you kind of push through and kind of keep that, you know, keep your spirits high and keep the energy going? I, I don't, I mean, I smoke a lot, so that's not really advice I'd give you guys, but like... <laughs> Just, just, just pick up a pack a day sig habit. You'll be fine. No, I'm just kidding. No, don't. Sarah, no. I'm kidding. No, sometimes though I do just have to like um, to have a little moment of internal zen. I'm a rock. I'm, I'm calm. Like, how long did you work or be involved with the CRC before you got paid? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, that's the other thing. CRC does, it kind of has this really weird structure that you have to kind of break through. It's the first, you know, you have your internship that's three months. So I actually got paid a little bit. To, like I was doing some stuff during my internship where I was getting like occasional ses or, or sessions. And that was like May through June or July or something. I forget, sometime. And uh, then after that, basically there's this period where they call crew which is basically like they like you and you can stick around, but you're not necessarily getting booked on sessions yet. And, um, and though that, it's kind of hit or miss. Like I was, I'd get a couple sessions when people were gone and then all of a sudden I'd be like dry. And 
during that period, I definitely stayed afloat pretty much with mostly freelance stuff outside of CRC. And then probably around like September, um, two post assistants quit. And so then all of a sudden there was all this post work that they liked that I had to do. So then I started uh, getting paid. And then like pretty much through the beginning of the year until about like maybe four months ago, I was mostly doing post and then just like occasionally doing music. Eventually it switched now where I'm doing about half and half. It kind of, just because everything changes. Like if you want to break into the music scene, your best bet is to, you're, you're most likely going to get a music session because I will say it's way harder to break into music than it is post. If any of you guys come in and you're like, yo, I want to do, I want to do audio for advertising, like they'll be like, yes, cool, like let, let us show you how. Like it's, it's a lot easier to do that than music. Everyone wants to do music. So it's much more competitive. So your best chances are going to be those random Jeremiah sessions at 10 p.m. that on a Saturday, and like Sarah will call you at 5 because he just decided he wanted to come in, and none of us want to do that session. So then she's like, uh, okay, this guy will do it. And, like that's, and then if you can do those sessions without crashing and burning, like that's how she starts trusting you, and that's how you start getting more sessions. Um, did working at CRC give you like some sort of reputation for like allow you to get other gigs outside of CRC that I will bigger? yeah I'll say that um definitely there's there's other gigs that you know, just knowing any sort of environment where you're in with people who are in the audio industry you're going to get more gigs just cuz people are like hey like you want to do this gig cuz they know you um but I will say definitely you it's everything's in the industry is like a snowball effect like you start getting with some gigs get more gigs you're going to start getting other gigs just peripherally What's it like commuting and working? Oh yeah, that sucked when I first started. I was commuting from here, so I was, uh, <laughs> I was, uh, like, I had to get there at eight every day. So I'd always take like the six fifteen train from here, and that was terrible. And then I got a south side apartment, which was about an hour, and that was a lot better. But then I was there for about a year, and now it's about, you know, thirty forty minutes on public, like a twenty minute drive. Um, CRC's in Streeterville, so parking's terrible. So I recommend public. Um, if you're gonna drive, you're gonna have to pay, like, for a lot fee. So it's gonna be like, if you get going like an early bird, you might get like fifteen, twenty dollar parking, but otherwise it'd be it can be like forty bucks. It's crazy. Don't drive. Just don't drive. It's not worth it. Do you do any live sound production as well as like? I mean, at CRC or me personally. Like personally, I, like you work in a studio, but yeah, I do a little bit. I try to stay. Um, I try to stay more into. I mean, I, I do have some like live gigs because, you know, when gigs come along, like I take them. It's just the freelance work. Like I'm not always like, oh no, I only do the studio work. But I, I'm definitely trying to focus on like a lot of guys definitely do do uh, a lot of live gigs as well. Like that's one of the ways people will like get through the crew membership is doing live gigs like there's even some companies that kind of take a lot of people from CRC like there's a wedding company that ends up just taking a lot of CRC assistance a lot of times um, Chris Shepard now has a company American Mobile which does live streams for music festivals essentially and uh, so like a lot of CRC people will go do that so it's basically just he mixes the live streams real time when you say like freelance do you have like a home studio kind of thing? Or are you talking about, like, do you get access to the... I'm talking about, uh, you know, 1099. So it's how I bill with them. It's, um, like, I'm not on staff. I'm not on salary. I okay. They don't even take tax out of it. So I have to deal with that myself. I just invoice them for however many hours I worked in those two-week periods. So between, like, what would a typical day of post look like compared to a typical day of music? Um, post is much more nine to five. Like, if, um, I mean, for me, not so much anymore because I'm not really like a main post guy now. I'm more like an auxiliary. Like, they need me, they'll book me. Um, but like, if you're trying to do post full time, you're gonna basically come in at like probably nine o'clock. You have your sessions. You're you're much more um, much more like a secretary than music. Like music, it's all about the session. You finish the session and you're done. 
post, it's a lot more of like, all right, so now I got to slate all these and send them off to be uploaded to Extreme Reach. Or you have to have all, all these emails lined up and getting e like prep from all these different places and move, putting them into the session. So, um, I mean, so it, it definitely it's different. There's a lot more. You're, if you're doing like, a, especially as a post assistant, you'll spend a lot more time writing emails and a lot less time actually recording. Like the records will actually happen very quickly. Has um, like working and being an intern at CRC helped with like networking in other places as well, or it's kind of just like? Oh yeah, I mean I'm I'm pretty. I mean there's definitely um, work that I had before I do I started CRC that I still have, but. Definitely. And I mean, just being at CRC, you're still at a place, especially if you put your time in, where like, for instance, Chance, he just called in and Sarah was like, hey, yeah, we'll put you with our engineer, Jeff. And now Jeff has a Grammy. Like, there's just that possibility of that happening. It's, a, I mean, just being in that location, I definitely say is um, <coughs> helpful. Yeah. So a lot of times uh, throughout history, we've seen that studios like CRC are dwindling more and more. What do you see in the future for studios like that? Yeah, well, I would say CRC definitely. It's not, um, like, like you know how I said all the music is freelance now? Um, it didn't used to be that way. There used to be full-time music engineers, especially because advertising, um, like how CRC has stayed alive a lot of times is because it's a very diverse studio. We do pretty much any type of audio you need. And we're able to keep that with, like, music and post together, kind of bringing in that sort of income. Because, like, it used to be when you had music for a commercial, you'd have people come in and a bunch of musicians go into the music studio studios, have the ad playing, they'd record it to that, and then just print it out to tape. Now it's like everything's through a music library. We just browse through them, pick one, they like that, and then we're, we're good. So, like, there's just naturally stuff has dwindled down definitely way more now than it used to be. Um, and that's part of the reason it's like it's hard to get in now. But I mean, I think honestly, it's uh, in kind of the way that a lot of us, you know, younger people there, we're trying to make a push towards more production on the CRC side. It's because we're trying to like adapt to the new wave of music because new wave, like the most popular type of music in Chicago, it's still you know a beat someone can make on their laptop and then vocals, like. Um, so it's learning how to like just adapt to that um, and like kind of get in on that. But I think places like CRC are uh, definitely more stable than like a lot of other smaller studios just because we have such a like wide net as far as clients go. And the nice thing is like if Worst case with us, it's like, oh, we're, we're not making that much money. We can just shut down a couple studios. It's not like the whole building closes down, you know? So with, like, the music industry kind of changing, like, you know, you're saying, like, beats and stuff is, like, mostly what people want to produce. Someone just wants to be an engineer. Is there, like, is there, will there still be room for that in the future? Yeah, if you want to just be an engineer, you need to find a producer. Not, not, not like a beat maker, 100%. If that's what you want to do is just be an engineer, because there's definitely still room for that. You need to get a producer, like someone, because if you think about it, if you have a band that has you as a client, that's cool, but what are they going to do? Maybe one or two records, or one record every one or two years? You get a producer, those are how guys keep working, is because then this producer's like, oh, I have this other band I'm working on, and basically get some sort of relationship down where the producer who's the guy who takes the artist and has the vision and basically like tries to put the record together and then you're just the engineer making everything sound good. Like that's, and that's straight from like Chris Shepard's mouth. Like one time we were just talking for a long time and that's basically what he said just as his whole career is you gotta like, cause he started out with like Smashing Pumpkins and stuff is like who he was working on and just working with those producers, it's how how you keep work going. Yeah, what are your favorite uh, VST plugins? Um, I'm a huge fan of Sound Toys. It's probably my new favorite stuff. All of those um, Decapitator, Echo Boy, uh, Micro Shift. It's, I think just those plugins overall have, they're the easiest way to make something sound like from sounding just kind of okay to like sounding amazing. I'd say a lot of people use Slate. Steven Slate plugins. And the one thing that I think that has that works really well is when you're actually like recording in Pro Tools and stuff, because 
it's basically like just an effects rack that pops up. You're actually able to sh swap things out real time. Like if you want to throw it, try out these different things. Whereas if you're trying to do new plugins, you have to like wait for breaks you know, to actually insert and take plugins out. So that's what's kind of cool about Slate. Are you using a lot of isotope in post? Uh, yeah, Nectar gets used a lot. Ozone gets used a lot. A lot of just Waves Renaissance bundle stuff gets used. Like we still mostly use just like our compressor and the REQ and everything for the. But then Nectar definitely. Nectar and ozone get used in almost everything. Do you have your own like your own rig at home? Yeah, mm. I do. Do you mind asking what do you have? <laughs> yeah, I have. Um, I mean, I have a rig with Pro Tools and Ableton. Um, I have a Apogee Duet for my uh, interface, and uh, I've actually used that at work a lot. Like rant, like it's funny how many times like I, it's just randomly like something comes up and. I'm just like, wait, I have a rig with the duet, and like suddenly it saves the day. Like, I definitely say it's a it's a good thing to have some sort of rig like that. Um, plugins, as far as I use like sound toys, isotope for like any. I do like movie scoring and like orchestral stuff too a lot. For that, I use like Contact and uh, Albion. A lot of stuff I learned how to use here. Mostly still use a lot of that stuff. Like you guys definitely have more than enough plugins to to learn on this these rigs. There's way more plugins, I'd say, on these rigs than probably even CRC at their base stuff. I, you know, how much how much do you guys use outboard gear like compressors, and uh, what is it proportionally do you use? Well, obviously, almost all mic pre's. A like lot of times, actually, in the EQs. I'd say quite a well. It depends on the engineer. When we use compressors and EQs and stuff, most of the time it's on the way in. So it's just like we're recording and just putting the compressor through on the way in. Tracking. We're tracking with it. Like, and then there's basically one engineer who will sometimes like do a whole analog setup for his mixing with routing. That's definitely not as common, but it happens some. But it's way more likely to see stuff happening on the way in at this point. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you wish you focused more on while you were here? Um... I'd say I still could have gotten better at signal flow. Like, I, I really think you guys should at some point just, I mean, I know you probably will have to do this for some classes at some point, but being able to, like, draw, like even just with a pencil and paper, like, draw, the, a, like, a microphone and just f actually be able to trace the signal, how it's getting in here, how it's getting to the speakers, how, it's, how the, these pre's are routed, like, be, if, being able to learn this board I would say if you if you really know what's going on and, and not just know how to use it, like know how this stuff is being routed. Like, I mean, you might know that, oh yeah, when I press this, I get sound, but why are you getting sound? Like that kind of stuff, like that'll definitely help you in any studio, because that's what you basically have to do in any other studio is. Because the problem is when stuff breaks and you're the one who has to fix it, you have to know it. It's kind of stressful to be the like only one, or the last one. It's always, the engineers who are always to the, the most impatient and like the most angry or whatever are always the ones who I think are the most insecure because they don't actually know how to fix anything and they're just ex and the ones like who make it seem like it's all your problem for not having it fixed right away it's because they don't know how to fix it so it really puts it on you as the assistant to be the one to keep that running keep the session running was there any outboard gear that, that just really blew your mind I love the GML EQ it's a, a real LA two A's is something else. Um, huge fan of that. Uh, and honestly, just some of the pre's, like the 1073, we have some 1272 as well. Those are, they sound, those sound amazing. What are some of the mics that they have there? Uh, we have um, definitely a lot of Neumanns, U87. Uh, we have a bunch of those. But then uh, the U67s, which are like, the best like just microphone ever for just like a bass microphone like if you don't ever know what to put on something put a U67 on it if you can like it's just the but um yeah then the U47's um amazing as Neumann then we have some like um the Sony C800 it's great that's what like, Kanye did used for all of um all of like his early stuff um it's great uh some 249's it's a uh, pretty great. C, uh, AKG C12s, those sound amazing as well. 
especially for like singing vocals, anything like that. A couple last things. What what are some other things not to do that get you fired? Um, kind of as a that you've seen. Yep. Um, don't hit on any senior engineers' wives. <laughs> wives, that's a good one. Um, <laughs> Yeah, what's the story behind the that? The story is an intern tried to hit on one of the senior engineer's wives. Like, that's pretty much, I don't know what was up with that kid. Um, there's another kid, just like general don't. I mean, overall, it's a pretty chill atmosphere, but like, there was one intern who always used to just like pop a Xanax and take a dab before he came in in the morning. So it's like he'd just be like a zombie, and then I like asked him to make coffee. And I get it, and it would just be like filled with coffee grounds, like because I think he was using napkins instead of coffee filters. <laughs> like, don't do that. Don't don't watch porn in the studio. That's another one. Um, what about equipment? What about equipment? You know, like just like dumb things that people would do with equipment. Uh, <laughs> don't drop things. It's definitely. A good one. Um, yeah, I mean, don't, oh yeah, don't cat call clients coming in. That's another one. Guy, uh, it's, it's crazy to me the kind of like, it's like really 800 applicants and some of the people we end up with, it blows my mind, but yeah. Well, then maybe in conclusion, what, what would you give them as some advice just to, uh, to take with them um, as they're continuing their work here? I would say hands-on as much as you can. Like, really, you're going to, if if you're not using this space as much as you can, you're definitely going to regret it when you leave because, I mean, it matters how quickly you're able to learn stuff and, it, like, getting in how well you get along with everyone there. I mean, I don't, I don't mean to, like, downplay, like, all you need to do is be easy to get along with, and if you don't, if you don't no one's going to like you and you're going to fail. Like, that's not what I mean. But it, I feel like it doesn't matter. Like, I, I didn't have any any issue going in there. Like, no one was like, oh, you didn't go to SEA or you didn't go to Flashpoint or Columbia. Like, by the time you're in there, nobody cares. Like, you got to realize really how little anyone cares about you or what you've done. Like, you're basically starting from square one and you just got to accept that and try to, you know, build it up. Like, no one's going to be like... I, I mean, I don't know the last person who asked me if I had my bachelor's. Like, you just got to... <laughs> learn how to do the stuff. I mean, not to say it's not important, because honestly, all the stuff I learned here definitely helped me there. But what I'm saying is it doesn't matter, like, where you went to school. It matters what you can do. So, you know, take advantage of it. This is, this is, you guys have a lot more access to this space than most people in most programs. So use it to your advantage. Let's give a hand. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you guys.